This session is about evaluating the psychometric qualities of reading tests. We want to be able to look at the reliability, the validity, and the norming samples in order to choose tests that are valid and reliable for the purpose for which you want them. So first of all, choosing the test depends on the questions you want answered. Is your question, how well is this student doing in comparison to other students his or her age or grade? Do you want to know how well has this student mastered the important skills of this curriculum? Or do you want to know at what grade level is this student performing in reading? That will determine whether you use norm reference tests that are going to tell you how this student uh, does in comparison to other students, his or her age or grade, whether you use criterion reference tests such as MCA or STAR to see if they've mastered important skills, or for what reading grade level are they at, where do you want to be reading with them, you want informal reading inventories particularly the QRI-5, which is the one that we use. So now let's talk about the important questions you need to ask in evaluating these norm reference tests. You first want to know whether the norming sample was sufficient in order to claim what they claim. You generally want to see about 100 uh, students per age or grade being tested. You also know whether the students in the norming sample are similar to your students, and the best test of that is to see wh whether it's nationally normed and reflects the diversity of students ge geographically, age-wise, SCS, ethnically. For those of you who are teaching English learners, you want to see if they were including in the norming sample. And I'm going to tell you right off that very often they have not been, so you must use these norm reference tests that were normed on native English speakers with great caution. You want to know whether it's reliable. If students are going to get wildly different scores, if they're retested a couple of weeks later, it's not reliable. If it's not internally consistent, if the questions don't hang together, it's not reliable. And reliability is a necessary but not sufficient criterion for validity. Validity has to do with whether the test actually measures what it says it measures, and uh, does it predict performance on another test, similar test, or on a future criterion such as success in college. So now let's look at norm reference tests for reading and reading related skills. The receptive vocabulary test, the PPVT4, uh, will answer the question, how does this student's receptive vocabulary, understanding of spoken words, compare to his or her norm group? Uh, the RAT4 will answer the question, how does his or her word reading and spelling compare to age peers? For written language, the TOWEL4 story composition part will answer, how does his or her story writing compare to the norm group? And for the auditory analysis test revised, it will answer, does this student have an underlying phonological deficit? So what do the manuals say about norming samples? The PPVT4 was normed on over 3,000 people from age 2.5 to 94 years, 11 months. So that seems like a very reasonable number of, st of people per age group. However, they only tested students who were English proficient, so those of you who are using it with English learners will have to be very cautious in not using the norms for the test, but rather describing the kinds of words that your student knew or did not know. Um, they were tested across the United States. It matched the census, and in all other cases, they it was well represented as a diversity of the U.S. The RAT4 used a representative national sample of over 3,000 individuals, ranging from age 5 to 94. So again, there was a large number per age level. They controlled for many, many different uh, characteristics, and so again, it was well 
uh, 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 normed nationally. The towel for is for ages 9 to 17. Um, they tested it in 17 states, over 2,000 students. Um, and the only real description of the student characteristics was that it included a wide variety of students with different needs. The AATR was tested with beginning kindergarten through eighth grade. It was tested only on a Midwestern sample with 30 to 40 per grade. So you'd have to be cautious if you're using this in any area other than the Midwest. So what did the manual say about reliability? Keep in mind that reliability guidelines are such that you want to see at least a reliability of 0 0.70 if you're going to use it to make classroom decisions for on students. 0 0.80 for instructional decisions such as a, a tier two placement and 0 0.90 or higher for program change like uh, qualifying a student for special education services. So the kinds of reliability that you should see in the manual are test, retest, answering the question, will the student obtain a similar score if he's retested two weeks later? Alternate forms, if they are two forms of the test, does the student earn a similar score on both forms? And then internal consistency. If you split a test in half and compare the odd numbers items to the even number items and the responses that students have to those, they should correlate highly, indicating that the test items test the same thing. So let's look at the PPVT4. That looks as though um, it meets the criterion for being able to use it for high stakes decision making. When you look at the RAT4, um, it's at least in the area for grouping instructional decisions. When you look at the TOW for the test retest is 0.8 to 0.9 overall. However, the writing part of it has lower coefficients than that, and the coefficients are higher at the elementary level, but lower in high school. So you start to see some um, maybe warnings about you, heavily relying on the results of the TAL-4 from this review of reliability. Let's take a look at validity guidelines. Now I want you to put in your mind a validity coefficient of 0 0.60 or higher. Reliability says 0 0.70 or higher, but for validity it's 0 0.60 or higher. Okay. Construct validity. This won't have um, an actual score, it will be by um, argument. Does this test measure what it says it measures? Is it consistent with the theory that it's supposed to represent? And so the author should make the case for the construct being about reading comprehension if it says it tests reading comprehension. Content validity is usually uh, established by asking experts to agree to take a look at the items and to see whether they test the content that it says it does. Here in concurrent or criterion validity is where you'll see coefficients. So you're given two tests, one of them the new test that you're looking at or the, the test you're looking at using, and see if it correlates at least 0.60 or higher with another well-established test that tests the same thing. And very important, but very seldom documented, is predictive validity. Does a high score on this test predict future performance? For example, does the ACT or the ACT the ACT or the SAT predict college success at the end of freshman year. Um, you'll be surprised that in most cases it does not. So let's look at the PPVT4. Its content validity was measured by examining important words in a dictionary. Well, that seems reasonable to me. Um, for correlation with two other uh, tests, that also test language was 0.77, and so that looks quite high for me. There is no evidence of predictive validity in the manual. The RAT4, um, the content 
validity was established according to the authors by showing that there are developmental and changes in scores as students um, get older in the grades and past school age. Again, that seems reasonable for content that looks at how well does the student recognize words or spell. Um, it's correlation with the WIAT reading subtest, which is a very similar word recognition subtest, was 0.80, so that's a very high correlation. Uh, the TOWEL 4 was reviewed by Salvia, Eiseldike, and Bolt. Um, they uh, judged that the content validity appears to be well conceived for the test. However, they noted that there's no evidence that it distinguishes students with written language disabilities, and um, their statement was that given it that it has only two forms and relatively low stability, that is reliability, its usefulness in assessing pupil progress is also limited. AATR. Construct validity for the AATR developed by myself is that the distribution of scores from kindergarten through eighth grade supports the construct of phonological awareness as an early developing skill that matches reaches asymptote in later grades. In fact, it starts to really level out at third grade. And I would um, offer as criterion validity the fact that Rosner in 1993 revised his original auditory analysis test in much the same way that I had. And as with my norms, he reports mastery of phonological awareness by third grade. I would need to test a set of students with both the Rosner form and the AATR I created in order to get um, validity coefficient, I suspect that it would be high, probably well above 0 0.60. But that remains to be seen by research. So let's talk about understanding the test scores that you get. There are uses and there certainly are misuses of test scores. Let's talk first about the kinds of scores you get from a norm reference test. There are standard scores the mean of 15 or the mean of 10 and 3 with a standard deviation of 3 are usually the standard scores that are reported. I'll show you in just a minute what that actually means on a graph. They almost always also report grade and age equivalencies um, and I'm going to uh, caution you against the use of these as you will see a little later on. And they also often report stanines or standard divisions into nine divisions. One to three is below average, four to six day nine is average, and 79 is above average. Then they also report percentile ranks. So let me show you what that all means. As you can see from this normal curve score distribution, 2% of students are in that first standard deviation so someone who is right at that line is at the second percentile or a 70 standard score. Or if you're using a mean of 10 and a standard deviation of 3, his standard score is 4. Let's just go with percentiles for right now. So the next standard deviation up, there's 14 percent of the students in that. You add 2 and 14 together and you someone who's right at that line would be at the 16th percentile, which means that he or she did better than 16 out of 100 kids his age or grade, however it's normed. In the next batch of ranking of students, you get 34 percent of your students. Adding that up, you get to the 50th percentile. So those are the kids who score better than 50 out of 100. So you can see that by adding the percent of students in each standard deviation band, you get the percentile. And saying that a student is at the 84th percentile, meaning that he scored better than 84 out of 100 kids his age or grade, is much more meaningful to parents than, well, his standard score is 115 or a standard score is 13. 
but at least you see here what the standard scores mean in relation to the percentiles and the percent of students in each of the standard deviations. Notice the percentile is written with a percent sign plus I-L-E. It's not percentage, it's percentile. You also see how the standard uh, nines, stay nines, are distributed. Um, this would be a really good graph to print out and keep as you go through all of your assessments in this course. Don't report grade equivalencies. I can't say that often enough. A 4.2 grade equivalency does not mean your student is performing at fourth grade level. It may mean that your student got the same number of questions correct as the average student at, in the second month of fourth grade. However, it may also be an extrapolated score based on testing only three grade levels but reporting scores for eight levels by estimating upwards and downwards. In any case, no matter how that 4.2 is derived, I can guarantee you that if you're a second grade teacher and little Sally um, in second grade scores 4.2 and you, you report that to her parents, they're going to ask you why you do not have her reading at fourth grade level material. And this test does not say that that's where she can read. Only an informal reading inventory will tell you that, which we'll go through in a later presentation. Do report percentiles. Percentiles indicate your student's rank in relation to his or her age or grade. So if someone got at the 60th percentile, she scored better than 60 out of 100 students of his or her age or grade, whichever norms were used, age norms or grade norms. Percentiles, therefore, are least likely to be misinterpreted, and they're most likely to be understood by parents. So the bottom line is assessment decisions that you need to make in order to use norm reference test. Is this test appropriate for your students? Um, give you an example. Years ago, I got really excited about an ex expressive vocabulary test and ordered it. But when I came, I found out that it was normed on 600 students in the San Francisco Bay Area. Well, working in Chicago, I wasn't really sure that those norms would reflect what my students uh, would be doing with expressive language. The good news is that test has now been nationally norm referenced with the PPVT, so there's both an uh, expressive vocabulary test and a receptive vocabulary test that can be given with confidence for native English speakers. Is this test reliable enough for Tier 1 classroom instructional decisions? Remember, you want a .70 or higher for that. Is it reliable enough for Tier 2 grouping decisions? For that, you want .80 or higher. And is it reliable enough for Tier 3 high-stakes decisions like uh, special education or promotion? You want .90 or greater. And Bottom line, last question. <clears throat> Will this test give you useful information for teaching your students? So this concludes an overview of the choosing norm reference tests by their uh, reliability and validity and the questions you want to answer. In the next presentation, I'll talk about informal reading inventories and what questions they can answer and their psychometric qualities.